Bien, bonsoir à tous. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for staying up late for this last session of this Friday. Tonight we have a, a topic in this session, which is of course of prime importance and um, polemical. That is the issue, the question of uh, ecological transition by growth or quote unquote degrowth. So to um, talk about this, uh, there's quite a few of us here, seven people in all. And so I'd start with a short introduction. Then uh, François Villalé-Diallo, the, the governor of the Bank of France, will follow. And then Eric Londard, director general of the Caisse des Dépôts. Jean-Pierre Farondou, uh, perfect uh, organization, uh, pres uh, president and general director of SNCF. Uh, Monsieur Farondou, Michelin. Uh, uh, Rodolf Sade, the uh, CEO of uh, CMA CGM, and uh, Alicia Orsena, the Executive Secretary of the Commission on Latin America, uh, studying uh, the economic situation of Latin America. She will give the vision of emerging economies. So I will introduce this session. We have a strict timing we only have an hour here for us seven it's a question of prime importance there are uh, two versions of uh, the energy transition the, through uh, degrowth that we call can uh, judge as pessimistic the only way of reducing in line with the international agreements is to reduce the GDP. So this version uh, is based on the fact that today the reduction of CO2 emissions is only half of what would be needed to limit the uh, rise in temperature of uh, 1 degrees 0.7. One degree the idea is that we will not achieve this by other techniques, so we have to use the uh, limitation of the GDP. They said we need to uh, also wonder how we proceed, how we lower the P GDP. When you talk to uh, those who support this, uh, this strategy, well, it's through regulations. You regulate the consumption and transport, uh, foodstuff, uh, energy consumption. And so there's a, a package of regulations, of regulating uh, activities that restrict, that limit uh, consumption and uh, with standard that, uh, standards that aim at reducing the CO2 and the GDP is lower by, uh, because we've reduced the, the, all the consumptions in the necessary proportion. So the speakers uh, of this evening will react to this proposal. I um, don't think they're all favorable uh, to this um, perspective, but I mean, it's a an idea that is shared by a lot of younger people uh, and so uh, I think it should be taken seriously. Second strategy proposed by econo economists and industrialists is the strategy that boils down to massive investments. Uh, we have a measure that is relatively uh, accepted of the uh, investment needs for the energy transition. So we're talking about investment in the decarbonation of industry, transport, in the production of uh, renewable energy, storage of energy, the thermal renovation of rehabilitation of buildings. And this represents four GDP points each year for 30 years in terms of additional investments, uh, i.e. 100 billion euros of investments per year. And we only invest half now. So this explains that the degrowth, quote unquote, is half that that would correspond to the trajectory of the Paris Agreement. So before handing the floor to our speakers, a few thoughts on this second strategy. You should let, be led to believe that it's simple. Even though we see that there are considerable technological progresses that have been made in the production of renewables, for example, uh, the hydrogen sector, uh, network, smart grid, uh, a lot of progress is, has been made, the, the different techniques for the production of renewable energies, for example, for solar concentration using sodium technology, a lot of technical 
advancements, but despite these uh, progresses, we need to be reminded of three things that should uh, sort of like limit our enthusiasm. If we invest more, we consume less. No more GDP, the same GDP level, and we need to invest a greater share of it. So we have to be very sober in our consumption habits to be able to finance these investments. So it's an after-war economy will destroy capital. We will no longer use the fossil capital and replace it with a new form of uh, new capital. To do this, well, involves a lot of investments, a massive need of investments, like in the 50s. And so the second topic is that it's uh, generally ag agreed, accepted that renewable energies are clearly more expensive than fossil energies because it needs to be stored because of the intermittence of production. So inequalities, redistribution aspects, issues, and we see that today for other reasons, but it will be an important uh, uh, topic in the political debate. And the third topic is that energy transition involves a lot of raw materials. Uh, think of lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel for electric batteries, uh, copper for the cables, or aluminum for uh, high tension. Well, the demand for this, these uh, raw materials is exploding. The price of lithium was multiplied by seven in less than a year. Uh, so there's a question. It, uh, uh, are these technologies for the tra energy, for the ecological transition, will curb the uh, CO2 emissions? Will it, we be faced with other scarceness, uh, scarcenesses? Uh, you know how we can reuse metals. That's an issue that we want to address. So, I have the floor. Maybe to François Villeroy Gallo at the far right. So, François, you've got six minutes to. Give us your opinion on all this. Thank you, Patrick. Good evening, everybody. I would like to first tell you how happy I am to see X again, even if we're here for a difficult discussion. I propose in six minutes a music in uh, two rhythms, a prestissimo one. The first, I'd like to talk about my former boss. He said the problems which have the, a single solution are the most simple. In other words, we have no choice because those who want to refuse the transition uh, will take us to the uh, a disaster economically and ecologically. We did studies on the uh, GDP effect in 2100. We don't pretend that we know this with a lot of precision, but if there is a, or, uh, a, a transition, it will cost five GDP points if we refuse the transition. And then we're running a, a major physical risk that will cost three times more to the economy, 20 GDP points. No choice. Uh, I recognize that the uh, diversity of our opinions is not at the level of our topic, but I don't believe that quote unquote degrowth is a desirable or sufficient strategy. So it's not desirable because it. Uh, uh, we don't have the, the the revenues that we need to, for the investment increases inequalities and tensions of distribution or social violence it leads to so it's not sufficient because it depends on the content of the the growth and if it's associated to an intelligent uh, strategy if you want to say keep the same mix it's not an efficient strategy so there's one strategy left that is decoupling so Economically, it decoupling. Uh, I'll take the simple, simplest ratio. You take uh, something that translates the uh, footprint, the uh, carbon footprint, so CO2 emissions, and denominator is what translates the economic growth, that is the GDP. The good news is these coupling or decoupling indicators. I will take in the sense of coupling mark a sensitive reduction of the environmental footprint by GDP point. I don't know if you have the, the idea of the sizes we're talking about. In the last 20 years, since the 90s, in average, the coupling dropped by 1.8% per year in the world. It's even better in the Europe. In Europe, we're reducing by 3.3% per year. That's the good news, but it's very far from being sufficient. If we want to reach the net zero by 2050, 
uh, the world level, we need to reduce the coupling by 9%. So multiplied by 5 at the world level, multiplied by a little more than 2.5 in Europe. So time two, my second movement, uh, which doesn't come in contradiction with point one. Uh, the second movement uh, is that if it's, we have a single solution, which is uh, decoupling, it can still be complex and it can impose the adding of multiple actions, the addition of multiple actions. There are multiple challenges to take up. Patrick Artus listed a few. I will just, uh, since we I only have six minutes, I will only boil, uh, focus on three. The first that Patrick mentioned was the question of investments. Obviously, I think we all agree on the uh, sizes, uh, very significant. We're talking about a thousand billion dollars at the world level additional investments, but it's financeable and reachable, in particular in Europe, because we have abundant resources. I don't know if you were here when Christine Agal was here uh, early in the afternoon when she talked about the union of capital markets. It proves her talent, huh? but she was applauded for that, but it can be green. We have the resources. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier than the other challenges <laughs> I will mention. The second challenge is that there's no sustainable decoupling or sustainable private investment if you don't have a price, a tag for carbon, if you don't have a clear economic sign that it's our, in our interest to decarbonate. And this is a topic that is much more complex, much more difficult when you talk about social distribution. You know, the, the expression in France, which is the better known, is uh, gilet jaune, uh, the yellow jackets. You know, everybody heard about the yellow jackets. Uh, look at what's happening with the uh, uh, energy sh shock with Ukraine, uh, how we, uh, we, what we do to compensate this, but it shows that uh, what needs to be done to avoid the yellow jacket movement, uh, there's the, the technique, is it a tax, uh, the permit, uh, the level, is it the same everywhere in the world, or if, it, if you make differences like the uh, IMF uh, proposed it, but you have to have a price tag for carbon. And if it's not worldwide, well, you have to have border mechanisms uh, in place. And there is no decoupling if there is no international global commitment. You can do what you want in Europe at the European level. I think it's very important. I will conclude with this. We know that China, with 29% of emissions, represents as much as the US plus the U EU plus India together. And this really raises the issue of multilateralism. It's not in good shape. I would tend to say that uh, when it comes to multilateralism, what Trump started, Putin continued. And, uh, but I believe in, in the possibility of a targeted multilateralism uh, or uh, egocentric multilateralism of interest where everybody uh, uh, joins and agrees. Because on the climate, there are no winners if not everybody is a winner. I went in with the climate. I think Europe in that aspect should have two postures. That is to be make proof of entrepreneurship, ready to take risks and be the leader because the world needs the European leadership on that. Obviously, there are a lot of risks to fail, but the only way of failing for sure is in action. So let's take the risk of investing, uh, bringing together a world coalition and overinvest, but I think there's one sector where you, uh, Europe is united and where it's in advance. It's uh, and it's that domain. And I would like to share Leon Blum's uh, quote. He died in 1951. The last sentence, his last statement, is the following: Leon Blum, I believe and I hope. I he I believe because I hope. I think it's a good program. Eric, uh, I hope you prepared a quote because the floor is yours. No, I plan to quote uh, François de Roy de Gallo, but I will do that later. <laughs> In fact, my reasoning is the following. You know, with serious people, you have central bankers and you have uh, the Swiss reinsuring companies. Uh, I did a lot of analysis on what would happen in 2050. 
uh, if we keep on going with the climate regulations, there will be a drop in the world GDP of 20%. So the degrowth is there. If we do nothing, the climate costs $1,750 billion per year to our economy. So what should we do? Well, humbly, and that will be a bit of advertisement for the Caisse des Depots, uh, that is to take an active part in the drop of 50% of uh, greenhouse emissions by 2050, a, a commitment that is extremely demanding. To do so, you have to take care of the major sources of emissions, starting with housing, buildings, and the thermal renovation of uh, public, private, social housing costs a lot of money. And I'll go back, uh, in reality, it doesn't bring much, even if you save energy uh, energy costs, but you have to transform, transform our mobility, transform our cars from uh, carbon to electricity, install charge uh, charging posts, um, uh, have uh, electric uh, coaches, buses, transports, hydro hydrogen uh, uh, buses, uh, take care of renewable energies also. Even if it's a big debate, you know, wind turbines, solar panels, and nuclear energy, and even more to more, all this is costly. And then we need to transform our industry and our industrial processes so that our industry is slowly but surely decarbonated. But what's important is not carbon emissions, it's the carbon footprint of the full cycle. So we'll have to repatriate a lot of production in France, relocate in France, because we have a decarbonated energy and less transport, of course. And so uh, all these topics, the, number, the figure that uh, Francois uh, gave, it involves massive investments. Regarding the case de depot, we plan to invest in this transformation 60 billion euros in the five coming years. And so eco economists will tell us uh, what it's all about, but I don't think we know how to invest so much without growth. Uh, and Francois said, and uh, deep growth uh, uh, leads to social and political consequences that are massive and that we want to avoid. Uh, so I'd like to sh focus on two consequences uh, because they're not uh, analyzed uh, thoroughly enough. A lot of these costly investments have no economic return. I was I visited a major industrialist of the region who who is going to invest in uh, reducing its carbon footprint, uh, billion millions of euros, uh, and that would uh, that will degrade is operation and so this will contribute to uh, to lower the uh, uh, profitability in certain economic sectors another uh, problem is that the energy uh, transition is very costly for people we see it with cars the people who need their automobiles will go from a diesel car they've had for 20 years to an electric vehicle that is more costly more expensive uh, organic farming without fertilizers is, is more costly, it's more expensive. And we can do that for most topics and to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the poorest people face in the inflation, uh, which I'm sure it will be controlled, but under control, but the increase related to all these investments that do not generate economic benefits. Uh, so we'll have to raise the incomes the revenues. And so the only way of solving this uh, equation is that the synthesis of all this is we have to lower the profitability of the of capital. Uh, uh, we were in a long period uh, where the profitability of capital was really high. Now we will have to accept uh, a lower uh, profitability, otherwise we won't manage. So uh, what's ahead of us it would seem is not the issue of growth or degrowth. It's to know what kind of capitalism will enable us to properly allocate the investments in an environment where we will need uh, to, to allocate more to wages and salaries and investments without economic profitability. Very good point, this point about uh, the profitability of capital. Jean-Pierre, the point of view of SNCF. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be with you as well. It's gone to practical work. We'll get into the sector of rail mobility. Maybe answer briefly the question asked 
growth or degrowth from a principal, general principal point of view it's quite simple so growth in a decarbonated way yes but uh, carbonated no so we have to think about how to make uh, the carbonated uh, activities greener I think this is adapted to every sector regarding rail uh, transport if I talk about France and Europe, which is our proximity area, I don't see how we can reduce mobility. We can think about it, but when you do, for travelers, it's links, exchanges, discovery, contact. It just has a meaning for us to live together. If we all live in our own corner, and living together will disappear. We need to meet, get to work together, and France and Europe is that. We have the subject of, of European construction, and even French construction, not to mention goods. You never have all of the uh, factories next to where we live. The factories will have to be in uh, Europe, maybe, hopefully, rather than uh, elsewhere in the world, but there will be goods still traveling, not to mention E-Trade, which is also so become something we are uh, used to. I can't see how we can reduce uh, the mobility of uh, passengers and uh, uh, travelers and goods. Well, I'm, I'm on both sides, so uh, so the rail, because it's electric and decarbonate doesn't work. If it's diesel, it doesn't work. If it's electricity made with uh, coal plants, it doesn't work. We're lucky we have to cultivate it. We have decarbonated uh, nuclear and uh, renewable energy. But my project with these principles is while respecting the other modes, I'm not anti-road or anything, and the uh, rail will never be able to replace all the cars and uh, lorries. Maybe it's a dream, but it's not realistic. But we want to have a larger market share for the rail. It's good for uh, protecting the planet. So we have some figures. I figures I like to mention TGV, 50 times less uh, CO2 than a car, and uh, so there's a considerable impact on uh, the carbon footprint. And energy, it uses less energy. It's a physical reality. If the engineer is with us, a train doesn't actually have any, it doesn't have any friction. You know that uh, if you, the tires is um, supposed to adhere so, so that uh, the cars uh, don't uh, lose their grip. And it's a considerable relationship. It's 1.5, so less energy is used by the rail. And the third interest in terms of ecology is uh, the ground surface, uh, which is more limited. You can have uh, greater masses of uh, travelers and uh, goods on less surface. And then we have the networkers. We never talk enough about the networks. When you're in a train, you see your train, you've got to comment on the train, don't realize when you came, hopefully, to uh, Aix-en-Provence by train or elsewhere, on the train you have an exceptional network. So within a millimeters, you have cross over the uh, Rhone uh, with a millimeter precision uh, over the Rhone, for instance, the bridge is over the Rhone. So you're traveling at the same, uh, same speed as uh, Formula One car, and you were able to have your coffee and chat and everything. The bottom of funding, boy, actually, I had a bit complex as it cost 100 billion, but I have less uh, complexes than has others. We are 100 billion ready to double the rail traffic in goods and travelers. We shouldn't be afraid of the figure, especially when talking over a 10 to 15 year period. Our major neighbors have already decided on it. Uh, we're still talking about they have uh, decided uh, on this, uh, large uh, investments, uh, 8.6 billion per year. And the Italians, maybe, also have decided uh, 170 billion for the railroads. We're still hesitating, but we will overcome this hesitation. So 
100 billion beyond the fact I said it's over a 10 15 period. So, only 50 out of the uh, state budget. We also talked about accepting the effort of a socially, you can think of a kind of a tax system because uh, transport creates a value. We've never managed to capture it. Maybe we should try and do it this size to improve the finances of the state. If we develop uh, oh, we are the uh, trains in uh, and around large uh, cities, the SNCF can help uh, with this effort. You obviously we're maybe not doing as uh, well as others. We need to be more effective and uh, efficient. And uh, if we think of trains and sta uh, stations, we can find investors as well with a real return on investment, maybe paying for the capital in a finer way, it's part of the landscape. I think we can find this 100 billion. So to conclude, the NCF or will already change France want with its TGV. Imagine France for a minute without TGV, you wouldn't have got trucks in three hours. You would have come by car, by plane. Imagine France without its TGV. It's 100 billion, the same. Over 40 years, this time it's uh, 10 to 15 for this uh, uh, SNCF paid, and they can't pay at all this time. Other people will have to make this investment. I don't know more for high speed, it's for daily life trains, so that people have a true alternative to, uh, to um, cars. Uh, it doesn't exist today. For instance, it's 18 percent freight uh, in uh, Europe, uh, 22 for we're 4.9. We're really on the bad side. When we look at motorways, uh, the ring roads from cities, uh, and uh, the diesel engines think it's worth making collective efforts so that we can double the number of goods carried on trains. So to conclude, I would say I feel encouraged by the previous presentations with uh, much more hindsight and uh, more global. The project uh, that we're talking about fits into the two logics. Uh, so I will fit into what was uh, said by my feet. There's something that we need to do. And I hope that uh, political decision makers will be brave enough to do it. Laurent, work to do on tires now. Jean-Pierre knows this. I come from a city with a, no TGV and uh, supports uh, minimum investment to reduce uh, this in between Clermont-Ferrand and Paris. Compared with what was said by those who spoke before me, I say this question of degrowth for me, brings up the question of the development model that we have had so far, which uh, led the word world to where it is today, with a lot, a great lot of progress. We have progressed a lot, but a number of things uh, are still there, a lot of waste, inequalities in uh, the wealth distribution, a lot of uh, climate warming, global warming. The question is not as we would say we need immediate degrowth because socially it's not possible. When you have half of the world living le with less than $5.5 a day, how can you tell them that the growth model which uh, uh, created wealth of uh, people who live like they do in, uh, in France, for instance, uh, is not possible? They are not appreciated. They want access to growth as well. Amongst the questions we asked ourselves at Michelin was to say that when you insist just on the economic value created, you lose a certain dimension. And you said, what is the value for uh, people? And what is the counter value created for the planet? And these two other dimensions today, we have no measuring system to give an equivalence. Price of CO2, for instance, we are very much in favor of it because at Michelin, on all the investment projects, on all our activities, we have a price for CO2. We realize that the CO2 at 100 euros a ton doesn't help any of the projects move because of the acquisition cost today of fossil energies. At 100 euros is expensive, not enough. 
have to put it up. How far we'll have to see. But the question asked is very important, the question of distribution of wealth for people. The people are also to about suppliers, customers, also the employees in companies. The question of uh, value distribution is it's essential if you want to accelerate in terms of technology, and I think we have no other choice but to find technology to solve the problems that we created ourselves. We need to find a way to distribute value in a more equitable way, and you need to innovate an ecosystem, you have a distribution system where you're not irrigating the fields for your, uh, your suppliers and your employees not benefiting, so to innovate you have to think about value distribution differently as an, in an, as an ecosystem. It's the same between different countries in the world. When your country is well, paying on a base of 100, others can only pay 10. When the work is alienating and it doesn't carry any development, it can't work. And so you have a strong inequality between countries, which unfortunately leads to very damageable situations. So how can we change from the strictly economic model that we have seen so far to a system which means we have a better balance, three-dimensioned, value created for people, for the planet, and from an economic point of view. And until we have rebalanced these values, I think we will be in a very difficult situation to innovate and go uh, to progress. Entires, of course, a whole field of innovations, and we must be very optimistic. Three years ago, we launched a ambitious operation, said all of our tires, and we make about 200 million a year, all our tires will have 100% uh, sustainable uh, components, uh, either resourced or recyclable. Saying that today, our say, sustainable part is 28%. Over a two-year period, went from a vision where we said by 2030, maybe we could reach 40% to uh, uh, now we are practically sure that we will reach 50% by 2030. And the further we go ahead, the more opportunities we find for innovation. If you respect the idea of repetition of uh, value with our suppliers or our clients, we can really accelerate in innovation. I've had a sort of innovation with that NCF. We create something which can go on uh, roads with, uh, with tires and then go on to rails. The reason there's less energy used is because you, there's no distortion on the uh, on the, the wheel on the, on a train. So we need to find where we can move faster together than on your own. And we have to talk about wealth distribution. This leads to very interesting discussions. So, so I wanted to say that we have to be perfectly optimistic and the only possible way to have a reasoned growth is something which is feasible. Rodolphe, another means of transport. So I'm delighted to be amongst you this evening. To answer the question, of course, as far as I am concerned, you need growth. Why is degrowth not desirable? For three reasons. First of all, developing countries need growth to go on developing. Two, how can you finance the ecological transition if there is no growth? And third, in terms of employment, if we have a degrowth, it won't be any good for employment. Once you said that, you mustn't do uh, just anything in terms of growth. And I hear about uh, wealth sharing, and I hold the questions coming up regarding sea transport, freight cost, and so on. Sharing wealth, of course. Of course, there is a 
wealth sharing should happen. The group, the CMACM, GM for more than 40 years has been reinjecting all its profit into its own development, whether for investment in logistic companies or taking shares in other companies, uh, uh, containers or ships. So more than 80 percent of our profit goes to, for investment is a way of sharing wealth, which is not bad. We can always say it's not enough, maybe, but I think that's uh, pretty good. Obviously, we can always do better, and we have a whole set of uh, measures that we're trying to implement, particularly during these difficult times where the purchase uh, power of French people is suffering so much. We are trying to do our best with a series of measures. What we also wanted regarding growth uh, is to think of it in a different way. The objective to start with is to protect the planet. And what should we try to do regarding this element? Go on growing in the way we have done for years is not desirable. So we have to think a bit differently. What we wanted to do is to uh, in work on uh, uh, work on acquisitions and uh, external growth of the group. What we're also trying to implement is to think a bit differently on how to grow. Where do we need to develop more? Everything regarding ecology, protection of the personnel, social aspects and societal aspects. A group like ours, which is a family own group has an objective which is not the result uh, at the end of a three month period, but the result of a long term investment, which is why it's different from other major groups. Every time we want to look a long way and invest uh, over long term, where a ship will be uh, amortized over 25 years, and when we have a whole fleet of ships to worldwide, what we want to go on doing is to have a Group, which is a national champion. And with our investments, we are trying to keep going ahead in this direction. What we also want to encourage is everything concerning the movement of uh, goods in circular economy, in second-hand products or recycled products. We are encouraging and noting that the intra-regional traffic is strongly developing. A few years ago, most of you, when you purchased a freezer or refrigerator, it came from China. It traveled a long way before it reached your kitchen. Today, most of them come from Turkey, and most likely from other countries in Eastern Europe. We are trying to encourage these movements by reinforcing our services, and particularly the intra-regional uh, services, including intra-Asian. Maybe a concluding word. I think that growth is necessary. We are all convinced of it. But uh, not any growth at any cost. And for us, it is a subject as a major French group, very present internationally. We must remain responsible. We mustn't uh, be dazzled by our results. I'm saying we are taking measures, we're trying to do a lot, certainly not a, a, enough from what some are saying, but we will go on doing everything we can to go on developing our growth, but a growth which takes into consideration the planet, because without the planet there's no sea transport and no logistics. Thank you. Lena, we are, he's giving us a very interesting of Latin America and emerging countries on this issue of uh, energy transition. Thank you, Alicia, for being with us tonight. Thank you so much, Artus. I'm sorry I will not be able to speak in French, but I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, first of all, I want to raise uh, one question that I think is very important, and that is the growing asymmetries between developed and developing countries. And I think Florent uh, and, uh, and Rod Rodolf uh, mentioned this very clearly. So there is very little space for developing countries to, to go for the growth How, uh, uh, due to these very complicated uh, uh, gaps that we have 
in, in economics, in health, in climate, in crisis responses, etc. So I have three ideas that I want to share with you. First of all, to set a new course of development, we agree that in the region like ours, uh, economic growth cannot continue expanding at the expense of extraction of biophysical resources and lower labor costs. So, uh, but, and so growth is only feasible if linked to sustainability and equality. So there is a centrality of decarbonizing. And so therefore, what I would like to raise as my first idea is selective growth. Selective growth is what we need to go for. Sectoral investments that create value, social well-being and environmental sustainability. And we have identified in Latin America and the Caribbean eight sectors that can help us to do that. But the challenge is innovation and systems of production and consumption that can create value while reducing environmental impact. So which sectors have, be, have we uh, identified? Transition to renewable energy. And we have costed that. We will need an investment of 1.3% of GDP annually to move electricity to, towards renewability, to renewable energies in the whole of Latin American region, and we can create 7 million jobs, and that should be done annually for the next eight years. And that is feasible for electricity. Secondly, retrofitting in urban spaces. This is very important, building and vehicles, and this is connected to electromobility. The, uh, the, the fourth is digital economy. We definitely need to move to digitization, and we have calculated the costs of digitizing all of the uh, households in Latin America. 66 million households do not have correct, uh, proper access to internet. Agroecology and agroforestry. This region is mega diverse and ha is, ha produces food, but we need to do it in a sustainable way, so we need to move towards that direction. And circular economy, is another area where we have to invest. But all of this is connected to manufacturing industry. We cannot only remain relying on extractive industries. We have to move to manufacturing. Now, these sectors will need, and this is where I think international cooperation is key, we will need cooperation from European countries and from uh, developed countries to release critical patents to move into sustainable technologies. I think this is a must particularly in water, energy, and critical sectors that these developing countries need urgently. My second idea is massive investment, public, private, and foreign investment, with proper regulatory framework. In the region, we have calculated that we need to go from 19% of GDP, very low investment is happening in our region, to 26% of GDP annually, which is the, the average of the world. And we need to then reposition and rethink public sector and public policy in this innovation process and the relationship between private and public sectors because market and business alone cannot create wealth on their own. It's crucial to their productivity, the services that are provided by the state, education, health, social care. You in Europe have these issues resolved, but in our developing countries, we don't have these issues resolved. They have a lot of, there's a lot of gaps in education, health, and social care. And also in, in basic infrastructure, for example, 166 million people do not have safely managing uh, drinking water, for example, and 400 million people do not have sanitation. So investing on these sectors is essential and also is possible and feasible with joint ventures between public and private sectors. So um, the third idea, is that the creation, we have to go for the notion that creation of economic value is a collective process where distribution of income and wealth have a positive impact on development. So I fully agree that there is a powerful case for rebalancing the distribution of earnings between capital and labor. We definitely need to reduce the profitability of capital, move it to labor and to sustainable development, to sustainable investments and knowledge, technology, innovations offer the most important route. So we need to shift our economies to information-based goods and services. But the problem is that we need to move over also to a public framework, a regulatory framework that does not tax labor, but taxes energy and materials 
and we have to move towards notions, for example, like a basic income, because in, in our region we have 200 million people in poverty out of a continent of 650 million in total. So we do have still great uh, amounts of people in poverty that will need basic income for on one hand and reskilling education and creative capabilities. So uh, I, I think that we need to move to a convergent uh, growth, let's say, not any growth, not at any cost. We have calculated that we will need 4% of GDP growth to make a convergence between environmental, industrial policies and equality. And if we are able to have a convergence of these three growth rates, that means uh, uh, environmental, social and economic, we will be able to decarbonize, to move to structural change, and more importantly, to move towards equality, which we have calculated that 1.5% of the richer, of the 10 of the richest the zeal has to transfer uh, via fiscal instruments or via other me mechanisms, 1.5% to the bottom 10%. So the, these are concrete solutions, my dear. Degrowth, yes, degrowth can occur in developed countries, maybe open space for consumption and production to developing countries. This is my basic points and my ideas. Thank you so much, Arthur, for inviting me to share these thoughts. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you very much. Uh, nous avons quelques... By the way, before, uh, I leave the mic, before I leave the mic, one thing that I think is, is simply not acceptable is that Europe and the U.S. are di diverting so much money for military action. I think this is, this is impossible. And going back to fossil fuels, this is what's happening today. This is what we cannot, it's not acceptable for anybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alicia. Euh, nous avons quelques minutes pour débattre. J'avais une question peut-être pour euh, qui veut. J'ai une question pour notre débat, donc qui veut prendre cette question Quelque chose que nous n'avons pas parlé est la qualification des emplois. Est-ce que c'est un problème dans votre corporation Est-ce que la transition change la nature des emplois Et comment vous adressez ce problème La question de la formation continue des individus tout au long de cette transition est absolument cruciale. Notre estimation, c'est que d'ici 5 ans, probablement 50 so we have an effort to redesign a training where we're learning techniques to where you learn to learn. And this is a major subject, and particularly in France. And let me say that you really need to have a, a basic mathematical content, not to be a mathematical specialist, just to be able to do a simplistic rule, say this is bigger than that is. And today in companies, and particularly when you recruit some students, I'm surprised by the way they reason. And in the world in which we are, transition, where transition will be possible thanks to technology, we need a basic uh, scientific training and content that we don't have today. François. Well, to add to what Florence just said, and along the same lines, I think there's good news in what Alicia told us. I think we all agree. The climatic revolution and the digital vegetation revolution are moving in the same direction. And there was a lot of preparation for the digitalization. That can be good news for Max. A lot of our uh, co-nationals say, I consume at a distance with my iPhone and everything, but there's a bit of consumption that has to be controlled but there is a lot of gain. And I think we really need to speed up in along these parallel lines. Patrick, can I come back to the question that Eric Lombard mentioned about the profitability of capital investments? Well, I wanted to anyway, so I'm anticipating then. I think that Eric and Alicia came to it. It was a central question concerning the massive investments they're talking about 
how do we get them beyond the profitability level, which is not the case today. There are several leverages to reduce this uh, uh, profitability threshold. So I think it is a, a failure over the last 10 years. We interest rates have been very low. We contributed, no doubt it was a good thing, but when you look at the cost of capital and companies, the demands for return on investment uh, remained with two figures, hadn't moved much. It has to drop. The problem, it's a purely private variable. It's nothing to do with public monitoring and it's something we need to follow in the public debate. And there's two other leverage points which I think we can use. Highlight cl climatic uh, risks of an investment over a long term uh, uh, period. This is the work that we do, the Banque de, the Banque de France, uh, the European Bank, are supervised but today when there's a decision for investment over a 10 or 15 year period. And this, with associated funding, the decision must integrate the extra financial aspects linked to climate and ecology. I think we can do better. It's beginning to start, but it changes the priority of investments and uh, bring up to the top of the pile any uh, the, those that have a strong climatic contact. So it comes back to it, but Florent Manico mentioned it, the question of the price of carbon. The best way to make the investment profitable is to put a price on carbon. I say, if we don't manage to do that, I'm not very mostic about the capacity to get private funding for decades. I talked about the internal debate in Europe with the Gilets Jaunes and everything, but the heart of the debate here clearly is with the United States. The movement of Biden administration on carbon is remarkable in uh, international forums, uh, but unfortunately, there is an essential part, the price of carbon. Our Canadian friends are bringing that in, I think, that here. If we want private funding to move towards funding, we have to change the, uh, in the incentive. So to come back to what has been said, the cost of capital is an implicit agreement between economic stakeholders. It was 15% for a while, now we say 8 to 10. And we promise investors, and we can decide. The cost of capital is lower. It's what we decided at the Caisse de Depot, where it's only four. It's easy to say you're public, but it's true that we don't have shareholders, we need to be profitable. So profitability is even more important for us than for private actors, because we cannot call upon the market. So the 4% is a citizen uh, uh, and social uh, commitment, but uh, we talked about it in general policy earlier. The companies that can should put the wages up when it is possible. There's a lot of social tension in this company expressed in different ways. So we can move towards lesser demand. And we see look at what's happened after the last 20 years with the weight of capital. There's been a mechanical consequence, a mathematical one, Laurent. A massive increase of the state of those who already had an estate and those who didn't still have none. So there is a difference in wealth which is less and less accepted and not acceptable. So you have to make the most of the following sequence with the ecological transformation for the social model to change. And this is not Marxist, or maybe it is. And I think we need to reflect on this, and it's important. And finally, I would like to get back to the subject debate. We need economic growth, and we need uh, degrowth in uh, profit. Pierre Rodolphe, you can respond. We've got two minutes left. <coughs> to come back to what Eric said, I think uh, the lesson to what Laurent Berger said, 
everything is happening at the same time. Just this link, there's a strong transformation in the relationship between employer and employee. And this is, if we talk about uh, wages, we're seeing a complete change, and all this must be uh, see how we can associate uh, our employees with the transformations ahead of us. Oh, so very briefly, if you could summarize your question. I'm sorry, the question is being asked without a microphone, so the interpreter cannot hear and therefore translate. Uh, sorry, people don't speak into the microphone. Uh, it's impossible to translate. Um, sorry. There's a key file that a company called CDC Biodiversity is meant to act the same as for carbon, you can be measured. So we create an index called the Global Biodiversity Score, and I would encourage all companies, some of the major rent companies have already taken it. The others have to measure their influence on biodiversity to limit it. And say so recently we refused it too. Uh, profitable uh, uh, projects because we thought this um, index was too high. So it's something which is coming, it needs to be speeded up. And you're right. We had two things. One, I share regrets of the first speaker, just saying, don't change convictions. It would be difficult to plead for degrowth to integrate biodiversity. Real hope on what is happening at an international scale. You know, there's a biodiversity conference, COP50 COP instead of 26 on climate. And we, France, have the Bank de France. We took an initiative at the end of 2017 to have a network, a network to make the financial system greener. We have progressed a lot in terms of climate, and now we have biodiversity with a document published last year. We're beginning to get figures behind the climate trajectory in terms of measurement and everything, but we are getting into this very strongly. So, I'll just close in a few seconds. I think it seems to me that there is a hope to make commitments over time makes things move faster and say we need to go there and see that research is moving faster. That, uh, things always move faster when you have a close uh, limit. That's Another thing, the difficulty that we have is acceptability, the price of CO2. We know it will lead us in the right way. It's about uh, two, should be about 200 uh, uh, euros per ton. Today it's 80. So this will not be the only incentive. Uh, not everyone is prepared to see a double of companies, obviously. All this will necessarily need to a drop in financial profitability because uh, less uh, profitable investments will have to be made and also to have a greater distribution to correct inequalities. So the demands and, uh, will move. Those will be like in the 1980s where the profitability levels were not very far from the uh, interest rates on the market. So thank you all for staying so late and have a good evening.